I didn't think this was going to work based on like what the TTV and the FDA and everybody was telling me about my recipes like a year ago. And now I have all these bars I can walk into and like listen to people lighting up from their drinking this. And like, oh, that is so everything. This is Startup to Storefront, the podcast where we talk to business owners and entrepreneurs about the untold challenges of scaling a business. That color. That sounds good, right? We're here with Margo, founder of Wave Maiden Ale Works, an amazing, hopefully new beer brand to come out. We're here drinking an amazing beer, cocktail, ale. Tell us a little bit about your company and, and what, what this so is. This is Riser, and this is one of my herbal ales. And my line is funky experimental herbal ales that are rooted in plant medicine. And so what you are drinking is a ferment of organic plant material, organic sugars, and ale yeast. Um, this one is hibiscus, rose hips, and goji berries. Mm. It's a beautiful color. For if you can't wow. see it, um, hibiscus color comes That's through. That's delicious. It tastes very clean. Yeah. Like super clean, right. really crisp, like really nice. Like minimal ingredients and you can taste everything about them. That's amazing. I'm getting the goji berry. That's delicious. I got started by wanting to marry my favorite two things, which are craft beer and plant medicine. And is your background in plant medicine? It is and it is not. Okay. So my journey with craft beer started at 21. Right out of school, I was working in a thankless, very low-paying job in PR. <laughs> and um, so very I Very thankless. Yeah. A lot of yelling. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it wasn't really food for the soul. But, yeah. you know, in order to travel and do the things I wanted to do, I started serving tables on the side. And I got a job at a place called Rock and Brew in El Segundo. And it was an awesome place to work. They had 50 rotating taps. And so all like local me, beers, or well, at the time the LA beer scene was really small. I okay, we had less than 10 breweries. What year was this? Um, it would have been 2011. Okay. okay, so not too long ago, but okay, yeah, got so it. Pretty fresh, and yeah. Uh, so I was lucky enough to try like everything that was coming out of our local breweries. It was like El Segundo Brewery across the street, and like Monkish and Torrance, and um, I just got an amazing craft beer education there. You know, not only did I fall in love with the beverage, just as like an endless possibility kind of thing, but yeah. also seeing like the community it bred, I felt like it just brought friends together and um, and it was just like a happy thing for people to share. And so I became a craft beer nerd from that point moving forward, but it was really just sort of like a hobby. So fast forward, I uh, started working in production. I left PR. It wasn't for me. Um, and... While I was production managing commercials, I found that I was starting to feel really sick. And I feel like this is like a story you hear a lot with people that find themselves like working in wellness or starting wellness brands. Like I just started to feel sick. Yeah. And How did you f- figure out what it was? Well, I went to a couple different doctors and got different opinions. And I was like, I don't think this is for me. Like I don't want a clinical Wasn't working. diagnosis. Like, I what did they tell you? I guess it's not a solution to wow. that's it's not, you know. Another yeah. story. This is our second story where someone got diagnosed with IBS, but it's like the, you, you don't find anything out. Yeah, when that yeah. Happens. It's really not no really answer. And and it's so disappointing to hear that that's still happening. A lot of people tell me that's still happening to them. Yeah. And really, our food is like our biggest issue. Yeah. And so I started to see nutritionists after like trying out a bunch of different weird stuff, <laughs> and um, I really loved the way my body was responding to adjusting my food. And so I got down this path of like really trying to clean things up. Not that I was necessarily allergic to, but I was definitely really sensitive to gluten yeah. and I wasn't able what to. What did you change in your diet specifically? Yeah. So, I mean, just realizing that like, just because something says it's an organic corn tortilla or just because it's like a vegan cheese doesn't mean that it's not like a heavily processed. Right. Or with like, tons of sugar. Of the food it's supposed to be. Right. And right. And you know, going through that much processing, like on a molecular level, you're losing so much of your nutrients. And yeah. so your body's just basically like deprived and stressed. And it's yeah. like, you know, like, but I'm feeding it all the things that are I've had a friend. all natural. Like, right. There's no regulation on what's all natural. Especially in this country. Yeah. yeah. No. I've had a friend go all vegan and he just gained a bunch of weight. Yeah. And then he, um, but everyone knew he was vegan. He'd like post on Facebook all the time. But he, he thought he was does. being healthy, right? Thought he was being super healthy. And then after a year, he, he posted on Facebook just saying, 
you know, being vegan means so much more than what I thought. And this whole time I thought I was being healthy, but the thing that I need to stay away from is actually processed food. Mm -hmm. And it was like a revelation to him after being, you know, vegan for a year. Right, because French fries are vegan, but French fries aren't vegan. Oreos. Mind and body. Yeah, Oreos, Oreos are, are vegan, vegan because it's just all there's sugar. There's no actual food in there. No, nothing. No. Not, no there's no meat. It's not meant for <laughs> No. Um, or so, anybody. Yeah. So, I mean, once people start to attack, which I feel like we're really going to this, like, food revolution, I mean, the very beginning of it, but we are starting to, like, awaken to, like, food being our medicine, and so I was experiencing this, like, six years ago, and I just, like didn't have a lot of friends that were into this, so I was, like, being a little crazy and weird. It was too hard to go out to dinner with me, and that was kind of the end of that conversation. And at this point, did you know that it was gluten for sure? I knew that gluten didn't make me feel good. Okay. And I knew I wasn't allergic to it. I wasn't celiac, but I knew it wasn't for my body's chemistry unless it was, like, a super special treat, which was usually, like, a crazy beer that I got to at a bottle shop or something that, yeah. you know, that was, like, the cheat that I was willing to risk it for. But So um, were you super sad to learn that... You had just found this love of, of craft beer and you were, you, as you say, like a, a total craft beer nerd. Mm-hmm. And then you couldn't really have it because you were then gluten free. Yeah. Like that terrible. is so stressful. <laughs> so I'd be so disappointed. Yeah. I mean, first world problem. Yeah. But, um, but no, still. it was still really sad for me. And like what was available, like going to Bevmo and like local bottle shops. I was like, so I can drink like some not mm. very tasty like sorghum beer that no. was like made by a big conglomerate. I'm, I'm gluten-free and all I drink is Corona and Pacifico when it yeah. comes to beer. Right. And, you know, we have, like, more come out, but it's gluten-reduced. Right. It's not yep. gluten-free. Mm-hmm. Um, so for people with celiac, that's not a solution. No. Anyway, going back to the food as medicine, so I was really into into nutrition at the time. I was following some really small brands that were making, like, tonics and, and different powders. And I went to this event with Mercado Sagrado. I just, like, its first or second year they had done it. it was really small. Here in L.A.? Here in L.A. at the okay. Malibu, yeah. Okay. And I found, like, a couple women that were making their own, like, crystal essences and different tea blends. And I was like, this is cool. I want to make it for myself since I'm on yeah. this whole, like, I'm healing myself journey. Yeah. And um, they're like, actually, there's this woman... I think she started a branch of a school kind of similar to where we went in California. Like, I think it's called Gaia. You should look it up. And so I went like a week later and and it took a little bit of like Google searching, but I found the school and I started to read the description of like what we were going to learn about and like some of the activities. So it was a class, like a, how long was the class? Yeah, it was actually like a a full year. Wow. School for who? What kind of, like who, what kind of people are in the... plant medicine school. Yeah. Okay. Plant spirit medicine. So using like the intelligence of plants and also learning to be in relationship with land. So part Hmm. like clinical, like herbalist and then part just like earth tender and and, like emotional, like like wellness. Did you know you were going to make beer? Like, did you know the whole time that you were thinking beer plus whatever? No, I had no idea. And it was so, (laughs) it was so funny because I had just gone to a, a psychic for the first time, it's the one and only time I ever went to a psychic. And so you're on the full road to discovery. I you're was like, like let's try everything. Yeah. Let's just go for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was doing my doing my whole exploration of all things weird and uncomfortable. And I went to the psychic and she was like, yeah, oh my gosh, it's hard to hear through all the noise because you have so many guardian angels. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> and, yeah. then, um, and then she was like, okay, I see it. And she was like, okay, you have so many guardian angels because you have so much work to do and they're here to protect you. And you're going wow. and you're talking to the plants and you're taking them back and you're putting them in bottles and you're listening and you're going back and you're talking to the land and you're putting more plants in the bottles and you keep filling the bottles with the plants. And I was like, bottles. What is happening? And she kept like, saying bottles? Like, yeah. And I was like, I don't, Interesting. I don't know, like, I don't really touch like plants on the regular I like to garden <laughs> yeah like, great I really like gardening I like being outside and going camping wow. um, I was like I don't know what just happened and then I was reading this on the web page and I was like no way so I sent it and I was like I mean maybe I'm meant to be here so I sent it an application and I got an email back from Marisha who is the um, woman in charge she started this California branch she's the teacher at the school and she's like it's perfect you were actually the very last slot I have open. no way so you'll be enrolled for like next year and wow so I just felt like this whole time it's just been meant the to pieces be, are just in 
serendipity. Fitting. Yeah. So you finished the course. What do you? What's like one thing that you learned in this course that you didn't know before? I'm sure there's a lot of things. Yeah. Like, what's the, what do you really? Yeah. Well, I think like the biggest takeaway for me was um, the way that Marcia taught us to work with plants is that we would sit in meditation with the tea made from a plant before we were told anything about the plant mm. and allowing it to come into our body and consciousness, like paying attention to like where we went or what where we found like. A, sharing consciousness like with a plant and yeah. letting it activate certain parts of the body before you have like a preconceived notion mm. of what the plant's supposed to do for you was right. such a unique and amazing way to learn the medicine of what is available totally us in nature so, so you graduated from the program and then what did you immediately think so you I wanted to do in production at the time oh, wow. i've been in, i was in production for uh i mean i actually started in high school so i've been in production for 10 years and I was like, I really just need something like, to feed my soul a little bit more. I don't know if I'm really ready to like totally leave because it's just like, you know, I'm young. It's just great money. It's flexible. Yeah, sometimes like any, you know, hmm. anybody in LA listening, it's like in the industry, like they're like, this is a terrible job. Like, <laughs> um, but, you know, it was really working for me at the time, allowing oh. me to like go through these other programs. I started taking in clients on the side. And uh, a lot of the time when I would check in with them, they're like, I don't know, I'm not like, I love the tea you made me. Like, I know when I drink it, I feel good. It's just like, yeah. I want to have like a glass of wine or like a cold beer after work. I'm not mm. going to like sit and make my tea. Yeah. And I was like, I Interesting. feel you. Yeah. Like, and I at this time, you weren't, you, you weren't drinking craft beer, right? Right. And I was so. like drinking a lot more wine and like I was making my teas and like adding like seltzer water and like, uh, you know, like quality, like organic mezcal or, or vodka to it. And so I was really like not interested in the beer options that were out there. And so I was like, I wonder if I can just start putting the plants into the beer. Like, totally. Is that a thing? And so I found this book. It's called Sacred and Healing Herbal Beers. And it was written mm -hmm. in the 90s. It's a, it's a gorgeous sort of um, exploration of like the history of our brewing mm -hmm. um, from ancient ferments all the way up until like the 18 and 1900s. But it is trying to paint the picture of how we were not confined to the ingredients that we're confined to now. Okay. Because now... How so? Well, there's sort of two parts to that. One is um, the way people were brewing, even like 20,000 years ago, is obviously like what was available, like right. readily available mm -hmm. outside their door. Or right. Their, I see. There know. were no imported ingredients or no. anything like that. No, and you know, we have like, nature has always been growing like medicinal plants like mm -hmm. wildly and abundantly all around where humans are and they were taking those and they knew how to decide if something was you know poisonous or psychotropic or just delicious and culinary and so that was what they were fermenting it was that and sugars and they these were open vessels that like wild yeast would come and in wow. some cultures they would like say prayers or sing songs that they believe like called in these magical yeasts like wow. and they would prevent the beverages for them and and that was the way it was done for a long time even in the 1300s 1400s witches yeah where witches were brewing for their communities alewives um alewives they're called ale um hence the name here we yeah. have the is, yeah. tell us about the name yeah. i feel like this is I a will, perfect segue I will, <laughs> I will tell you about the name well, they, all these women, they were, like, going and they would, like, commune in circle. It's, like, this imagery of, like, the witches that were burned. They were, like, communing in nature and they were coming together and saying, like, oh, I found, like, this patch of, like, you know, mugwort over here. Like, we'll all go gather it together. They were and just they were misunderstood. Brewing for themselves and brewing for their They didn't wear those hats, though, did they? They did wear the hats. They oh, wore they the hats did. that when they went to markets... They, they could had, fill them up. People knew that they were they were oh. identifiers. It was like a marketing tool. And you could see that above yeah. anybody in the crowd. Yeah. It's it right out. I feel like they were so misunderstood. Here they are trying to help people, and they're condemned as trying to hurt people and cause right. problems. Right. Yeah. And so that hmm. leads me to the other point of, of this is that um, there was an act called the German Beer Purity Act. Mm -hmm. And it was written, and I think it was around 1519 or something like that. And it said that, well, when they wrote it, it actually said the only ingredients that can go into beer moving forward are barley, hops, and water. And when was this written? Uh, in the early 1500s. That is so, that is crazy. How long did that remain the case? That's still the case. It's still the case. So why did they determine that? I mean, if all these other things could be put in it. Well, 
I know there's two theories. Okay. One is that there was a monopoly on these goods, um, like the monks oh. and the church had a monopoly on a lot of these goods and they wanted to force people to use these ingredients. The other is that um, some of these plants that I'm referencing have the effect to really lift people up out of their own bodies um, to help them shift consciousness and to make them feel like more excited or more sexy or whatever it is that they're feeling when they're drinking alcohol. Is that what I'm feeling right now? As, That's what it is? <laughs> whereas hops are a sedative. Um, if you ask me as an herbalist, somebody that didn't know anything about fear, what do hops good for? I'm like, they're not that good for you. I mean, if you needed like surgery back in the day, you would want to drink some strong hop tea and yeah. try to like put yourself to sleep. Yeah. Um, That's so interesting. Beer right. makes me tired traditionally, except for Corona. But right. <laughs> There's a Czech style of beer too, right? Huh? Like a Czech style of making beer? Well, there's all kinds of... Is like, it the same ingredients, though? It's just different process? Right. So okay. those, have, those have been adopted as, like, what malt beverage, what beer can be. Mm. Is they must contain these ingredients. And we really, like, lost... That. I mean, yes, we can... There are so many styles. I mean, the, in the U.S., like, our beer competitions, it's, like, over 100 styles wow. that you can create with those ingredients. Um because, you know, we're, we're still adding fruit, we're still adding yeah. spices occasionally, we have all, you know, we have labs now where we can have so many types of yeast available and overnighted to us. So, yes, there's still so many possibilities, but we're not actually infusing any of our ferments with all these really aromatic and medicinal plants anymore. Until now. Until and, now. Yeah. So you go through this experience, You and this book sounds like pretty yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. I read it in my Go day. check it out. Like, yeah. This is exactly what I've been like waiting for it like seriously it like set my soul on fire I was like this is like I have to go make this right now I went to a home brew store I knew nothing what'd you buy what what do you buy to start home brewing yeah so I I mean you get like a carboy and an airlock and a carboy yeah it's like a you've probably seen they're like glass like small like three and five gallon okay glass um I've never actually made beer but I've been around it a lot which you, I know a little bit about it, but I've never made it. So you get a carboy. Right. And, then... and um, so an airlock is something that like goes on top and it lets like the gas escape, but it keeps anything from like coming in. Yeah. Um, you, there are very like simple tools. You can get like a siphon, so when you're ready to transfer, you can like transfer it into a separate bucket and there are like racking arms and bottling ones to get it from wow. the bucket into the bottle and sure. like a capper. And you said you'd never home brewed before. Right. Okay. So, so how did you like discover how to do it? Home brewing stores are generally um, like they're the most <laughs> lovely people inside. Yeah. They like want to talk about it all day long. And yeah. so if you go in without any ego and you're like, just give it Set me straight, up. teach me. They will, and you're like, and you can give them your budget and like what you're trying to do yeah. and not know anything and they will take their time with you. So really they're wow. a, an amazing resource. So how long did it take from when you brought this stuff home and you were like, I'm going to make my own beer. Like, how many trials did you go through before you are like, this is good? Well, you know, I've never made anything that I found, like, bad. Wow. Like, so you just, really, right off the bat, it was delicious. I can't say, well, for me, it was delicious. Amazing. Um, so, wow. I, you know, I, I walked, you know, I had a lot of, like, struggle. I was like, why are the yeast doing this weird thing? Like, <laughs> is this normal? And honestly, like, I consulted YouTube. Yeah. Like, the you know, totally. great University of YouTube. Like, mm-hmm. pretty yeah. much was able to troubleshoot between that and like calling the homebrew store guys or like a couple of like homebrewing friends. Um, and my recipes were pretty unique because I wasn't doing um, barley and hops. I was working mm. with these plants. And so I approached it in a way that I normally approached um, making like a tea blend for somebody. So I would sit down and like, depending on what season it was or like what I maybe had like fresh from a friend's garden, I would sit and be like, what am I trying to invite into this? Like, yeah. do I want to make something that makes people feel really creative? Mm-hmm. Do I want to make something that, like, helps somebody heal a broken heart? Like, what am I trying to, like, Amazing. invite into this recipe? And so I would put plants together based on that and then experiment. It was just about flavor profiles, experimenting with different sugars, and then the yeast, the way it goes. And, um, yeah, it was it, wow. the trial and error I, I brewed for over two years before I really started like giving it out past like just like three or four people. Yeah, sure. And then and this one that we're drinking now, what's yeah. the name of it? It's called Riser. Riser, okay. Yeah. And so the plants in Riser are all like really elevating. Mm-hmm. Rose hips are the fruit of the rose bush. It's 
like at the end of the summer when it's given like all of its like nutrients to these beautiful flowers, like its last thing is to fruit. And so roses are the highest vibrating plant we have on earth. Wow. Um, and, and then hibiscus too, right? Hibiscus, yeah. It's amazing for like moving our waters for our creativity, mm. but it's also just like a really like energizing plant. Amazing. A really like heart centric plant. We have two beers with us. We have riser that we're drinking now. And what's the second one that you have here? The second here? one's called Comer. And Comer is made with mugwort, yarrow, and damiana. I've never even heard of what those. Is, yeah, what, what, okay. Yeah. How is it supposed to make you feel? I think Comer um, is a really like bright light. Like it mm. makes people sort of help like with their inner flame and mm. feel like really confident. And like yarrow to me is like a warrior plant. Like it just gives you like that little extra push to go like do what you need to do. Cool. And Damiana is um, for herbalists like a really great tool for working with people with like depression and anxiety. Wow. So it's really like. And are, so that's awesome. Bright, like, I'm going to have that are, one next. Are these um, plants native to California or do you have to find them somewhere else? For me, as part of my growing pains, like I, I have sourced with a third party called Mountain Grows for all the plant material that I'm making in like on a commercial level now. Um, but when I have my own space and I'm able to brew many more recipes, I hope to be work. I have like a couple farms I'm talking to locally awesome. um, to be sourcing with. But these, the, the company is wonderful. The third party, so everything's ethically farmed, ethically wow. harvested. Um, it's all organic plant material and sugar. Um, wow. It's, a, it's the same yeah. process where I know when you make beer, you basically, it's like a big tea kettle mm -hmm. and you're just putting like, the only beer I've ever seen made was a hibiscus beer. And so they put, I think it was like a five pound or 30 pound bag. I can't remember, but it was this massive bag of hibiscus. Is yeah. it the same in your case where you're just adding? Putting massive bags of yeah. measuring out massive amounts of plant material into wow. gigantic bags. Okay. And them into that same those food houses with the kettles yeah yeah wow. and is it challenging to source that much like of the rose ingredient yeah it can um, be right it it has been yeah, yeah. I actually i just completed a course with there's a organization called kiss the ground here in los angeles and they partnered up with an organization on the east coast called terra genesis international and it was the first round of a course um that was about regenerative supply and sourcing and it was looking at the big picture like how us as companies that care about our products and like our in relationship with like the land and our communities, how we can come up with a plan to continue sourcing mm. ingredients on a large scale and to make sure we're doing everything we can to support people that are putting regenerative practice into play on their land so that we're not creating this crazy demand that's really mm. degenerative for, for the earth, which is totally the opposite yeah. of the point of wave maiden. Yeah. <laughs> The wow. question I have, and I know we're jumping around a bunch, but we're trying and it's delicious. How would you serve it? Would you serve it like a regular beer or would you serve it? So right now we're drinking out of these um, enlarged champagne flutes. It's kind of like a wine flute. I guess that's what I'd call it. Um, but how would you serve it? Would you serve eight ounces of it or would you do 12 ounces or I less? I recommend a 12 ounce to 12 a ounces. Glass. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. like the recommended pour that I found, like the two of glass, because they have these really like extreme vibrant noses on them. It really okay. Helps. Um, and then, yeah, because temperature? they have that consciousness shifting ability, like I don't, in a couple minutes we can like check in, but like a lot of people start to feel like they do get, as opposed to a beer making them feel like a little bit like sluggish, sluggish, mm -hmm. that they feel a little bit elevated. Yeah. And um, so that. I feel elevated. Same. Yeah. Same. There's no question about I that. I love it. Um, oh. Temperature wise, do you experiment with serving it at different temperatures or is it I find the colder the it, better? It does That's just nice. as well, just with like on a draft system, like same temp, like 38, like same PSI, as well, it has no issues like pouring and I, and I think like it's good, as cold as can be. All right, where were we So you were asking me about dealing with like the ABC. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so right now you have like an R&D facility. Right. So, yeah, so I did what, it, so this is sort of like the beginning of the like battle for me. And this is what, this is why we made the podcast. So yeah. we made the podcast because people like you have a wonderful product and you want to go out and start giving it to the world. And this is when you, this is, you're in the part where you find out how difficult and annoying the people you have to deal with mm -hmm. are and blah, blah, blah. Bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. so you're looking Love for a the facility. They're super easy and fast. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. So, I basically I got brave enough and like that, you know, like we said, my background was like in totally different things. And I was like, listen, I believe in this. Like, I have all the things that have told me that I'm like born to do this. 
and I'm just going to scare myself a little bit and go for it. I love like it. Like a bit of, you know, like a little chunk of savings and working in production. I was like, let's see how long this lasts and just like put it. myself out there. So I started to just call, like, and I had that skill from production. I'll call anybody and stay on the phone until they give me the answer mm -hmm. that I need. So who would you and, call? Um, the TTB, which is like yeah. our federal, yeah. Yeah, so TTB is like a, well, you know about that. Um, basically, it's an agency that you need to get on board in order to serve alcohol or become licensed to do so. Correct. So TTB is just about um, what different operations look like. You can become a wholesaler where you contract your recipe out to somebody. Really didn't want to do that, only that for a couple of reasons. I didn't want to lose control of like my recipe. And I was also a little bit nervous because there wasn't a lot of like reference for me to scale up. Yeah. And because nobody else mm. was really working with this kind of material. And I sure. was just like, it didn't feel right to me. I wanted to remain in control. I wanted to get my hands on it and like see the process every step of the way. And mm. so I found out about doing something called an alternating proprietorship by talking mm. to them. You could rent space in an existing brewery where you have to record when you're using the brew house and like which fermenter is yours and when you're there and when you're moving everything. So there's like a lot of record keeping and compliance. But it does allow you to have your own brewer's notice and your own small beer manufacturer license. So mm -hmm. according to the government, you are your own brewery, but you know you you still don't have your like own like storefront tap room. But you could you could have a tasting room and then you and then can brew. With that. Okay, you, you can't. Can. Have, you don't have tap room. It's just a license, license to brew right. like commercially. But it is a Type Twenty Three license. Can you on sell the state side? Yes. Okay. So on that's the state great. Side, I didn't know. Type Twenty Three. So when I when I find because I use when I find my space, I can transfer <laughs> no. my type. You're in type 23. And type 23, nice. I think, is beer and wine. Is that right? It, type 23 is small beer manufacturer. Okay. Yeah. And what is small in terms of barrel size? It's like 100,000 barrels or something like that. Oh, it's oh, a pretty big threshold. So that's pretty big. It's like yeah. most, I mean, even craft, any craft brewery in LA County is, is like a small, small beer manufacturer. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Like, huh. not until you But for reference, they're not small at all. They're, right. Correct. They, Got it. There are plenty of people with type 23 licenses that are making more beer than I will make in the next decade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's really nice. I didn't know that. So that gives you a way to scale before you have a full fledged location. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a pretty, it is, I can say something positive, a flexible. And how much is it? So you have to submit your paperwork to, to Yeah. How long did it take yeah, from so then to get in your. Well, it was really, um, I was lucky enough to find like a friend that almost acted as like an introduction like broker consultant to introduce me to a brewery because I couldn't find a brewery in LA that would allow me to do this okay because people don't really want it's a it's yeah a totally trick. they're usually it's using like it very more paperwork for us and like we're trying to grow and so like what if in a couple months we're like actually can you leave yeah because we want to use this tank but you're, you're paying them right you're paying them like a what, rental how much what's the are you let's talk about that agreement so are you renting it out for one week a month or what's so you can't, right? It's got to be like or... a month, right? Has to yeah, be, yeah, so I pay like a rental to keep my paperwork and my license on the property. Okay. And then I pay per time I use the brew house. Okay, like okay. per hour or per week? Uh, it's a brew day. Brew day, yeah. got it. Okay. Okay. Brew day, and then when I like have to ask for like labor and whatever. They'll help you out. Um, then I can like, I do a lot of it myself. I also have like a fabulous assistant for and Laura that will do a lot um, nice. for me if I'm like, stuff and other things um, so how much do they charge you in like a month how much will you pay um i can't really say that i feel like that might violate okay our agreement is it um, hundreds of dollars or is it like thousands of dollars it varies month to month depending on what i go through but sure. it is is it reasonable it is, an, it is reasonable but okay. it is not a not ideal viable business model okay. long term okay, okay. because you run into space issues sure. um, with storing and... Um, and trying to keep everything separate, I would imagine, right? Yeah. All your stuff and, and their stuff. Yeah, right. And um, like empties and like I live in Venice and this brewery is in Santa Clarita and mm. I self-distribute, wow. like literally myself distribute. And so I have like overflow of like equipment um, and empty kegs and things happening all the time and just like ordering ingredients and like marketing materials and doing festivals and all the things that come along with that like it, once it's all said and done it's a really not a, a long-term plan hmm. it's okay. a proof of concept plan. yeah, yeah. Okay. it's a way to test things out 
get started, right? And right. then move into your own and space. And do you can it after or do you can it there? So I keg and I keg okay. it there. Yep, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. And, and then they, they're all kept cold and then uh, they get sent out to accounts. But I've only been selling, I've only got my license the beginning of April and I've only been selling then for like a little over three months and I'm already like sold out. Like I can't take on, I have about 18 accounts and I can't even really take on anymore because I'm wow. like sold out of products. Wow, that's amazing. That's so, great. Congrats. Proof of it's concept, a good problem to have. <laughs> you know, like the lack of sleep is starting to feel like worth it and yeah. it's starting to feel worth it because I feel like the proof of concept is already kind of like happening. Yes, definitely. Just three months in, I'm like, look, if I can make more, I can sell more and like people want it, so. And I know we have two varieties here, but how many varieties are you are you making or selling? Well, I wanted to start with three right away and then mm-hmm. I just have like, Riser is the most popular and it's so popular that I have to like keep brewing it um, and I can't really figure out how, when I'm going to be able to like bring the other recipes. And who's your market? Who's your primary buyer? Is it is it females? Is it men? Well, is it people that are gluten free? Yeah. What's the primary market? Bars and restaurants um, that want either like the newest thing okay, <laughs> or that have like a clientele in areas that enjoy like something that could have like a little bit of like a health factor or okay. gluten free factor too. Like something so. like Cafe Gratitude or some right. like places yeah. like, that. places like that. That's very um, surprising. I thought like, oh my neighborhood in Venice, like everyone will love this. Well like actually most of my accounts are like on the east side, like Echo Park and Highland Park have wow. received this with open arms. So it's hmm. just How do they day. introduce it? I mean it sounds like so I've been to I've been to um I've been with different breweries where we bring the whole, let's say six of the beers. And we bring them to them, and all these beers aren't on market, and they're not an ale or a pilsner or an IPA. They don't fall into one of those categories. And we're, meeting, we're meeting with like the the beer whatever mm-hmm. person, program right? manager, yeah. and this guy's always got a beard, and he's always like <laughs> tasting the beer, and, you know, doing that whole bit. And then he's like, "Here's the problem I have with your beer. Nobody knows what it is. They can't place it. Mm-hmm. They can't say give me that IPA because it's not an IPA. They can't say give me this because it's not that." Yeah. And so then, and he's like, and we're not, we don't want to sell your beer. We don't want to introduce your beer to the market. Because then they're the ones educating and taking a risk on right. you know, having and to explain it. And it's unfair to all the mm-hmm. other, you know, relationships they've already established. But that's what they're doing with you, though, it sounds like. Yeah. So I've put together, like, just educational documents as well as, like, I am the owner and brewer. And so I think because I've decided to like spend my time going out and sitting and like answering all these frequently asked questions yeah and making lists like specific to what they think you know a lot of times they'll say like well I think they're gonna ask us these three or four questions and I will sit and like come up with really simple answers for their bartenders Mm -hmm. so that like I'm not trying to convince them right of something I'm just giving them the tools as I would answer if I was able to sit and hang out at the bar and I'm sure they appreciate it because there's no guesswork there right so if I was at Echo Park and I would let's say I stumble into a place where Mm -hmm. your beer is what and let's say what am I asking for do I say can I have an ale and then they introduce you or Or what's the maybe it's listed as one of the names so their statement of identification for riser is hibiscus herbal ale and the statement for comer is damiana herbal ale Okay. Cool. And so I like it because it makes people curious about the plans. Totally. I've actually like, gone back at the bars and like, how's it going? Like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, it's great. Like, I've sat at bars and listened to people be like, wow. And they're like Googling on their phone what Yarl and Damiana are. And then like, ooh, maybe my mom would like this tea. Like, oh, amazing. She's feel, like, she's like going through a thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like that. Seriously, it makes my heart swell. Like, that is so much of this is to make this like a gateway to bring these yeah. plants to the masses and like what better way to introduce them than through like beer. Well, yeah. I love so, that. so now you're so your your contract or not contract room, but you have this this kind of nice temporary pilot license, mm-hmm. let's say right. things are going well, you're in stores mm-hmm. and now you're like, what do I do now? Right. So <laughs> I I mean it is the ultimate dream. It always has been to actually have my own space. I want to have my own facility. I've been like looking at my equipment I want, talking to like suppliers. I've been touring every brewery that will let me come in and like ask them all of the questions. But I think, you know, every single part is a challenge. Yep, There's like totally. literally like nothing that's not pushing back against me mm-hmm. right now. So it's so honest. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, I have, I'm having a great time. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. There's like, it's like, I'm telling you. Like, she promises everyone. Yeah. She loves it. Yeah. 
Everything yeah. is fine. I'm fine. <laughs> uh, no, the fact that I am able to share this, like, that felt like it was never going to happen. Wow. Like, yeah, you... I feel like so many entrepreneurs are like, I just, this is way too hard. Yeah. And, like, I could just get on a plane to Costa Rica and I'll just peace out and nothing will ever happen to it. And nobody will talk about it in a little while. But, like, I didn't think this was going to work based on, like, what the TTV and the FDA and everybody was telling me about my recipes, like, a year ago. And now I have all these bars I can walk into and, like, listen to people lighting up when they're drinking this. And, like, oh, that – Amazing. So everything's wonderful. That's like, an accomplishment. It is, like, half of, like, my mission is already, like, there. Now it's just how do I get even more of it out there. Right. So You call I a broker? Property. property yeah (laughs) has that been like the biggest struggle that you think or as of you know as of yet that you're like okay finding my own space yeah it's crazy i mean narrowing down the neighborhood first Mm -hmm. of all like it's it's, i've been talking about it for over two how are you doing that so what are you you looking for specific demographics or what's the just somewhere you like yeah so it's like part of it's like my left brain is part of it's my right brain so like i'm a rule follower so i (laughs) always like i did my homework like going to the city, like being like, these are like the three spots I'm looking at. Like, I'm going to sit here at this counter and like highlight them all and ask you every question about it until I feel like I know what I need to know to even like consider this part of Los Angeles. And so I've gone through all of that. It's pretty Um, painful, but it's so helpful. That's such a good upfront due diligence process to start there because a lot of people neglect that completely that they're even going to get permitted. Yeah, zoning is everything. And like I've been in a couple times and you know even not knowing like there's a thing called zemus and you can yeah oh, yeah zemus is great and people you know they like sign leases before they even looked at it's shocking how yeah. many people don't know that and so you know i'd say go in and ask questions so, like, yeah. i've done myself a lot of favors by like calling and going in like going into abc offices and like Going show up all the attitude mm-hmm. and all the questions until I know what I'm dealing with 100% and I'm not yeah. still like flailing and guessing like what I'm allowed to and not allowed to do like you have to show up and go through totally really uncomfortable government stuff and you, you have to so, so and, Zemus for people who, are, who don't yeah. know is, is basically a website you can go to you type in the address of where you're wanting to either you can it's it's even, org, but google it it's residential too Z-I-M-A-S and um, it's residential or commercial, and it tells you everything about the proper zoning for the land or the building yeah. that you're trying to get. And so, it gives if you you're, tax res- records, assessors' he, records. Here in LA, if you're wanting to start a brewery, you have to be C2, or you can be a manufacturing mm-hmm. zoning, which is an M zoning. In Houston, if you want to be a distillery, it's an F1. So, every state, city has their own abbreviation or letter. Um, but to your point, if, you know, if it's zone residential and you're about to sign a lease, you're never going to become a brewery. And, right. and you're totally right about people. Uh, I mean, right now we're in process of rezoning a building mm-hmm. or getting a zone variance. And, Which is and we knew that up front, so we were totally prepared for it. But when you know it up front, what it allows you to do is give yourself like nine months or make the, the deal contingent upon okay. your, your CPU variance. And so you're protected as a buyer. Yeah. But oh, to your point, a lot of people don't. Right. And I just want to touch on the bureaucracy and that process. I think a lot of people assume that, you know, when these these uh, municipalities or these uh, organizations give out, you know, with guidelines, okay, email this, call us at this number or whatever, that the most effective way to reach them oftentimes is to go and sit in front of them and to wait all day until someone will talk to you and give you the answers you need. Because there's a lot of conflicting information, even from within their own their own organizations. So, I mean, you're, you're spot on with yeah. actually going and figuring it out. hundred percent. Like, I can't <laughs> tell you, like, trying to, like, read through stuff late at night for, like, two weeks and trying to understand, like, everybody do yourself a favor and just go just into go. these offices. Mm-hmm. Like, no matter what so kind of permit or license or just question, like, it doesn't matter. If that's their job to yep. answer your question, no, it, they might want to be like, that's on this Length on our and website. you're like, I know, but you tell me. But I want to yeah. hear it, and I want you to explain it to me. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's and that's their job, and that's a resource that's always there. Just drive and go and get your answer. Like that yep. has been like the greatest thing for me. Go in the morning. Tonight. Yeah, go in the morning. Go as early as morning. possible. That's, uh, because one of the other guys <laughs> yes, in the hallway, yeah. yes, because that's when like they're the you. happiest. Like their day only gets Nobody worse. Yeah. At right yeah don't go to the building department on a friday afternoon everyone is, cannot wait to get out of there yeah, you're the worst yeah. Doing 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The so can is true. beautiful, by the yeah. way. For people who can't see it, it's, it's, it's a wave. Um, it's a wave. What is it? Is it? It's an ocean graphic. It looks like. Yeah, it's a photo of a, of a wave um, crashing on the beach. I want like the elements of nature to always be incorporated in my can designs, and um, the name wave made it because I did like jumble it up. So oh, yeah. the, it's a story in Norse mythology, and um, I always I, one of the things I learned in uh, the guy school was working with not only plant energy, but goddess energy when it felt right. And so I was like, my company might need plant spirit or goddess energy in it. And so I found these goddesses called the wave maidens and their father was a god named Agir. Hmm. And he was responsible for providing beer to all the other gods. And he had nine daughters and he taught them how to brew it. And there's this beautiful imagery of these like giant tresses, like mermaids, like crawling up on ladders and like dumping yeast into these like massive kettles. And, wow, yeah. so, that is so cool. That's so like, powerful. Love of the ocean and then like these beautiful Norse like, mythology. mythology. Yeah. I have to ask because I too am a female in a male dominated world. I'm in construction and um, I have to know, have you encountered any sort of a sexism in the brewing industry and do people like, are you I mean, just totally unexpected for them? What has that been like? Yes, it is a very male dominated industry. And um, I have, I felt like I've been lucky enough to only have a couple of cases of feeling really uncomfortable or uh, really condescended like publicly. But those are not people where you forgive them and you move on. But I would say, like it's even a little bit more challenging for me because I'm like, I'm going to show up and I'm going to bring all these like really lovely smelling flowers with me <laughs> and plants. And they're like, no, seriously, who are, what are you doing? And so um, a lot of people want to push back. Like, I mean, you don't have barley hops. This is like, you should get out of the brewery. And, you know, I just say, this has been a rule for too long. And like, I, the market is so concentrated. And if it, I feel like if you're scared of it that's like one conversation but like if you're really just like this lady doesn't know anything about what real beer is then we're just gonna have to you're just lost yeah, yeah because the thing is you do know and you found you know a better way you found a different way right so right i mean and i right now i'm not because i'm renting equipment that like wasn't equipment that i wanted for my uh for my recipes i don't have the ability to this is all technical stuff that people probably don't really care about, but I don't have like multiple steam jackets that allow for mash rests for me to use the ancient grains in my all grain brews. Mm. So when I have my own space, I'll be able to also be making these all grain brews, mm. which will have a little bit of hops in them and also some other plants to complement. But they will be gluten free as well. They'll be gluten. It's gonna oh be my a god! Gluten free dedicated brewery. Amazing. So who, who have you found is your market to go back to that? Do you think it's like who who really enjoys your beers the most? Um, I mean, it's young kind of people, like older obvious. people, it's young. It's young, young people, people want to try something new. Uh, people that like sours. Um, oh, okay. People that like foodies that yeah. just like new flavor. Yeah. Um, and then it is delicious. It's certainly, it like the, uh, a flavor I've never had in any beer before, and the, and it's an amazing right. thing. Yeah. So it's not for everybody, but. People that are open minded and they do like they'll. If you're a good person, you like this yeah, beer. Yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll people like one or the other way more. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. So let's go back. So you're so talking to brokers now. Yeah. And um, I'll just say personally, mm -hmm. I've, I work with a lot of brokers. Mm -hmm. And um, if anyone knows of a really good one, please let me know. Because they're yeah. so, they're yeah. like unicorns out there. Yeah. So tough. I started conversations with three people and I just can't get any momentum. And, you know, they want to like give you all the promises up front, but it's like. Totally. Yep. It's good to feel like there's a bit of a fire under your ass. Totally. Like, and I have that and I'm like always like moving forward with this. Like mm -hmm. there are goals and things to be made and like I don't want to be panicked, but if you're not presenting any results, like oh, I'm no. really just hurting my process. Right. Because it's, you know, so many extra emails and exchanges and you know site visits and yeah that. it's stressful for mm -hmm. everyone involved so totally. like, if you're not looking for like if you don't want to be a part of it like yeah you don't, you don't gtfo owe, you don't anything it's confusing yeah though, isn't it that they it don't is. they don't well like, i i mean i guess they just don't see they don't see it from your side they don't see it like every day that you're not in a space means another day of sharing the space that you're in and not being able to produce right. more varietals and 
you know, that's, that sucks. Like, right. and they don't, they don't feel that sense of urgency because they're just, they're going to get their commission. They think, right. you know, if you keep, keep up with it. My growth is completely inhibited. And like, this is the factor and mm -hmm. identifying where I need help. And I can't seem to find people to follow through with helping me. And it is painful. So it's kind of shocking. Um, you know, I've dealt with it a bunch and it's just the most confusing thing because they're, they get paid pretty well. And even that doesn't incentivize them to work harder, faster. No. It's strange. So in your, in your next step, you're looking for a building. How big of a space do you, are you looking for? I have been saying between 4,000 to 8,500 square feet. Okay. And when you have, you'll, you'll, you'll obviously brew there. So mm -hmm. it'll be a brewery. And is it like a 10 barrel system? What's your 10 yeah, barrel system? A 10 barrel system. Okay. With a tasting room component. The tasting room, yeah. <clears throat> now I feel like, based on this conversation and the beautiful cans, what if I'm walking into your brewery, right? What what's different? Yeah. What's because I feel like it's just going to be amazing. Yeah. But what walk me through? I feel like you have an aesthetic and you that. have a, a vision for this. Walk me through this. what that's oh, like. Yeah. So yeah. I walk so in. It is alive. The whole building. What's on the alive. walls? Do you have plants on the wall? Like plants on the walls. There's Love murals it. on the walls. It's like so much mixed texture do you have the that. ingredients in like buckets so people can exp like play smell I will have, like i can't wait i have too many ideas right now but like behind the bar that's like overwhelming so i'm like okay. i want everybody to see the plants and inquire about the plants um but yeah it's open space it's um bright it's living tons of greenery um like i'm envisioning like elements. hanging plants yeah. lots of like coastal elements and like textures i want it to like be like Southern California with a little bit of like folly, but like also Love there's that. a huge focus on like really feeling like held by the plants. Have you hired an architect yet or is that I haven't your next step? I sure. have talked to several. I, if I was going to work with one when I thought I had a broker and an architect that <laughs> were working for me. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I have not officially signed on anybody because it hasn't felt like totally right. And I just want to like feel... This is, I feel like I've sacrificed everything for this and I want to connect with people that like, I feel they're genuine. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you're a broker right. in LA and you really want to work with Margot, <laughs> please let us know. Yeah. Like just hit her up. Please. So you're looking, okay. So that sounds amazing by the way. Thank you. Yeah, what a what a vision. I think oh. seven thousand square feet is probably where you need to be. Yeah, six six to eight. Yeah, I was kind of, and I, I really want there to be some component of like outdoor space. And yeah, also like uh, some element that's like divided to do like workshops and like cool talks and everything. Um, I want Become it part to of the be community. Like, yeah, yeah, I want there to yeah. be like a lot of teachable moments and opportunities, but like make it fun, like drink yeah. some beer, listen to each other, come up with ideas. Like this is I love a it. place to like breathe like positivity for our future and so um yeah i definitely need like a little bit of outdoor space too because i plan to compost uh everything we can cool yeah. and will you have That's food awesome. on site or what's your is there a food plan food is like really intimidating to me like i don't want to turn food into, truck like, food truck yeah. yeah yeah smart and i think there's so many in la that oh yeah like totally in alignment there. and you have yeah. synergies with i think some of them out yeah there. yeah similar ideas similar visions yeah and i also thought like bring them in for a while and then when like it felt comfortable like even potentially having like a wave made in food truck mm -hmm. that would yeah. work you know permanent but yeah. Then, yeah would you disclose the locations you're looking at is it several is it a few yeah it's three that i've narrowed it down to cool um and so i was looking in downtown la area like playa vista and the south bay beach city but yeah. I do have a leader in there. I'm just like haven't found the space. Yeah. 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 And it's you, hard to find space. T tell us a little bit about what that's been yeah. like, even on your own. So without using the broker, um, you're probably using LoopNet. LoopNet yeah. is like the Zillow of right. commercial. commercial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like I know when I'm looking at LoopNet, like that there's so many things that are just like not on there. Mm -hmm. Like insider off yeah. market deals, yeah. off market Especially properties. in LA. I mean, that's one thing that I think I, we're using a broker here in LA and he just happens to know every single owner of every single building <laughs> in certain areas and nothing's on the market, but he's able to just cause he knows the stories. Mm -hmm. He knows is if, if you, the father owns it, but the two kids don't like each other. They're and right now they're the owners. Yeah. Like he knows everything. And so the, the localized knowledge when it comes to commercial is so, so important. Right. Um, I felt like I'm missing this like inside connection the whole time. <laughs> it's yep. really what it feels like. Uh, LoopNet, it's fine, like general internet searches. Like 
I feel like that's never going to be the way. I've gone and driven around, like, spent two hours and, like, taken pictures and written down the address and the phone oh, number. that's smart. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really smart. That's really boots on the ground. That yeah. Effort. yeah. Um, I haven't gotten, like, any, like, I've gotten, like, a one call back from somebody and then, like, the second round of it, like, to even be like, could you pass on your email address if I miss you in your next half? Like, I love that you're doing that. End. I yeah. love it that you're doing it, that you're trying. Yeah. And let's, okay, so now... Are you thinking about raising money now? Or are you? I am completing my pitch deck. I'm like okay. a perfectionist to a fault. How much are you looking to raise? Um, about a million and a half. A million so and a half. Are okay. you looking for to have like a small pool of investors, or to, to like mix in some Kickstarter, WeFunder, things like that, or like one yeah, method? I've explored. I've taken calls with like a variety of like. Um, crowdsourcing like crowdsourcing but with like credited investors and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff like i've probably had like four or five calls with companies like that and uh to be perfectly honest just because i feel like that's the point of this conversation totally people, like i feel like they want to like know a little bit about my like story and potential and then they just like get me off the phone and then they're like you know or they'll throw like numbers at me so fast that it's like confusing i'm like can you repeat that and they're like we'll email it to you and it's like I have gone, I've worked way too hard at this. You mean like yeah. reps at these companies? I, yeah, like yeah. you think I am not going to like understand every angle of this and yeah. like make sure I'm getting like a good deal here. Like, so I feel yeah. like they try to get people that are just like, just so eager to like start something. And right. Like they'll just sign off like, yeah. Oh, now all of a sudden this people that hosted your Kickstarter on 10% of your company. Like, right. You know. And yeah. I think it's so important too to like bring in, a lot of people think like money is money, but if you're bringing someone in as an investor that's going to micromanage your whole process and try to like get in where, you know, and, and just be overbearing, then that's not what you want. No, you know, it happens all the time. And then the biggest questions are like, how much equity do you want to give? So how much percent of your company are you willing to give? Um, yeah, I mean, it's I tough. feel like for me, like I, because I've been like a one woman show from day one, like I'm willing like to trade a little with equity for people that will add like value Value, Mm, totally like sweat equity it's like i feel like people don't put enough value in that Mm -hmm. and um i'm very open to it like the i wish i was money motivated i'm not really a money i have never been my whole life like a really money motivated person um some people say that's a bad thing i'm just like i think it's a good thing like a passion project of like me trying to contribute something i believe in for like the greater good like that is truly what is it about? And so I am not like focused on like how fast I'm going to like be rich. Like yeah. that was never part of the focus. I'm like, who's going to come apart and like help me do something yeah. better and greater for everybody faster. I feel like people that focus on the money are focusing on the wrong thing. You know, you, you need, you physically, Passion like, has you to actually be there. need money to yeah. get started, but you're not greedy about it. Your main focus is getting this out there to the world. And I think that's amazing. That's wonderful. So what are you, what's your timeline? So let's talk about, so right now it's, it's, um, August, 2019. And you, you said you got your approval, right? For, yeah. In April, okay. after like a brutal <laughs> government shutdown. I can't believe that. Of, like, oh. Right in this like, brutal government shutdown. Yeah. I'm supposed <sighs> to get it like, um, a week before Christmas. Right. Then, that was a so, long yeah. shutdown. Yeah. So Yeah. Speaking of sacrifices, like I didn't see my family for Christmas because I was like, oh, I can't buy a ticket home because A, I'm poor from doing all of this. Yeah. B, like I'm just going to get my license and I want to make sure like when January 2nd comes, I'm like throughing and handling right. everything. Because you thought you were going to get it. Yeah. And then it was because like. Because that's my birthday oh. and you wanted to make beer for my birthday. That's, I also January was thinking, 2nd. I also was thinking about that. Too. Totally. Yeah. I appreciate that. And then the government <laughs> shut down yeah. and you lost all that time. Yes. Wow. So, um, yeah, I was really like I said, I was like hemorrhaging money, and I was like for a minute I got stuck in how like it was just never gonna work, and it was and I was like going down that path is just like breathing negativity, and like I want to get the license and only like prompt my like positive vibes into the whole process. Like this is like a challenge that in five years I won't be like remember those four months that were really right. hard, and I wanted to start and I couldn't start because government like that's right. not yeah. You'll never even remember. worth it. So yep. uh, I got through that, got it in April, and now, yeah, it's been four, a little over four months, barely over four months that I've been a licensed brewery. So timeline, I'm like... You're ready to go. I'm, re- I'm ready. Yeah. Because because I see that I can't produce enough for, like, the accounts right. I'm interested, I'm like, I'm ready now. Yeah, yeah totally. You know when to grow. So you have an assistant brewer that helps you on, on demand. Um, what do you think your next hire will be? I 
think uh, I'm going to actually get a head brewer other cool. than myself. Yeah. Right. So you can focus on fundraising and yeah, the so location. Do you know anyone? Huh? Or are you looking for people? I'm looking Do you want to put it out there into yeah, the world? Yeah, I'm putting it out there totally. I am probably going to throw it out to the Pink Food Society, which is this wonderful organization for all of us women and beer as professionals um, to educate and fundraise and uh, vent. And yeah. Um, so Amazing. I'll put it out there, and then yeah, I'm totally just putting it out now. I'll probably put it out on my Instagram, which cool. Sure. Don't follow me on Instagram. Yeah. What's yeah. your What's your handle? It's Tell uh, everybody. Wave made an ale works. Wave yeah. made an ale works. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll put it out there, but yeah, in the coming months, that's another like we were just talking about, like sweat equity. Like I would be willing to give a small percentage to somebody that wants to continue um, nailing down some of the recipes I've explored before, like. And getting that's amazing. With the project. There's yeah. a lot of brewers that would jump all over that. Yeah, yeah and I like agree. we're doing funky recipe funky creation is so cool. Stuff like this is like an opportunity. Like I want somebody that wants to play, that is like just wants to be part of this vision. And yeah. it's like a, I'm giving a lot. I want to continue a lot of what I'm doing, but I'm also giving a lot of creative control to the right person. So. And are you still working? At somewhere else, or were you on? Are you full time on this? I'm full. Mm-hmm. I'm more full time on this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Double full time. Yeah, uh, I, that's great. Yeah, I'm able to like pick up here and there stuff, like little private clients still happen. Um, I like up until up until like when I got my license, I was still able to like day play or like do payroll for friends on productions and stuff like that. So yeah, like I think most people like. <laughs> you know, rice and beans for years. Like yeah. Real, you know. mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, look, Absolutely. thank you so much we've for coming that. on the show. <laughs> yeah. We've done that a bunch. We've been there. Um, oh, yeah. The rice and beans get better over time. Yeah. Basically oh, yeah. is the mm-hmm. net net. But find uh, at Wave Made and Ale. Ale Works. Yeah. Wave Made and Ale Works. At Wave Made and Ale Works. And if you're an investor, hit up Margo. If yeah. you're... If you have space or if you know... Master brewer. Of, of space uh, in those areas mm-hmm. that Margo discussed... Uh, in LA, between six thousand and eight thousand square feet, roughly. Please message us, message her. The can is beautiful. The product is amazing. It's Make so sure good. you guys go check it out. Thank thanks, you. Michael. Yeah, it's delicious. Yeah, thanks Super for good. coming. Such a good product. I can't wait. We here at Start at the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think about the show. Make sure to give us a rating on iTunes. Anything over five stars is the only way to go. Our music is composed by Double Touch. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Startup the Storefront. For more information on the products and businesses featured on the show, check out the links in the show notes. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.